After showing that B2 is a linear estimator, in this video, I'm going to show that B2 is an unbiased estimator as well. That is, I'm going to show that expectations of B2 is equal to true population parameter that is beta 2. Now see the concept of unbiasedness is something that I expect you to know from your statistics course, but let me give you a quick overview here. So see, whenever we talk about unbiasedness, we think in repeated sampling framework. So this is how it works. If you are working with a particular sample, then you are going to get only one value of B2 for that sample, right? Because there will be only one value of B2 that will minimize summation E i square for that particular sample. So that means for one sample, you will have one particular value of B2. And it is highly unlikely that the value of B2 that you have found in a particular sample is equal to the true population parameter that is beta 2. Right? So this is when we talk about only one sample. Let's now think in the repeated sampling framework. So basically assume that I have taken 500 different samples. Now if I take 500 different samples, for every sample I'm going to find one particular value of B2. Right? So basically I will have many different values of B2 for these 500 different samples. And the property of unbiasedness says that if I take the average of all these values of B2 that I get from these 500 samples, then that average will be equal to the true population parameter, which is beta 2. So to summarize, we can say that the property of unbiasedness in this context means that the average value of B2, if we take many samples, would approach the true parameter value that is beta 2. Okay. So this was a quick overview of the meaning of unbiasedness. Let's get started with the proof of unbiasedness. To start the proof of unbiasedness, let's write the formula to calculate B2. If you recall, while we were talking about the proof of B2 as a linear estimator, we discussed that we can write B2 is equal to summation Ki multiplied by capital Yi, where Ki is equal to small xi divided by summation small xj square. Right? So this is the formula of B2 that we discussed while we were doing the proof of B2 as a linear estimator. And we can start with the same formula. Now note that we have to work with a population model that is linear in the parameters. And we have assumed that our true population model is capital YI equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 capital XI plus UI. So this is the true population model that we are working with. Now I can substitute this value of yi here. So I can write that b2 is equal to summation ki multiplied by beta 1 plus beta 2 capital xi plus ui. Now see beta 1 and beta 2 are your true population parameters. They are not going to change. So we can treat them like constants. So if we multiply these two, then we can write that B2 is equal to beta 1 multiplied by summation Ki, right? Because we are treating beta 1 as a particular constant. And the second term becomes beta 2 multiplied by summation Ki capital Xi. And the third term becomes summation Ki Ui. Okay. Now we can use the properties of Ki to simplify this. If you recall, the first property of Ki is summation Ki equal to zero. So this is the first property that we did. And the second property that we did was summation Ki multiplied by capital Xi is equal to one. So we can use these properties here. So using these properties, we can write that B2 is equal to beta one multiplied by zero plus beta two multiplied by one plus summation Ki Ui. And this implies that B2 is equal to beta 2 plus summation Ki Ui. Now see this particular equation that I have written here is very important. This equation implies that B2 is equal to a fixed component, which is the true population parameter. So this is a fixed component. This will not change. And the second component that we have here is a random component and it is random because we have disturbance term in this component and this random component is a linear combination of the values of disturbance term. So this random component is a linear combination of the values 
of the disturbance term that is ui. Now see this equation is extremely important because sometimes in your exam you can be asked directly to write B2 as a linear combination of the disturbance term. So if they ask you that, that would mean that they are asking you to show this particular equation. Also when I switch to the proof of efficiency in the next lecture, even there I am going to use this particular equation to complete the proof. Okay. So now let's proceed further with this proof. So see we have written that B2 is equal to this. Now to show unbiasedness, we have to show that the expectations of B2 is equal to beta2. So now we have to talk in terms of expectations of B2. So if B2 is defined in this manner, then we can write that expectations of B2 is equal to expectations of beta2 plus summation ki ui, right? And using the property of expectation, I can write that this is equal to expectations of beta 2 plus expectations of summation ki ui. Now as we have already discussed, beta 2 is the true population parameter. So you can think of it as constant. And we know that expectations of a constant is constant itself, right? So we can write that expectations of beta 2 is nothing but beta 2 only. And then we have the second term as expectation of summation ki ui. So now we have got that expectations of b2 is equal to beta2 plus expectations of summation ki ui. Now note that if I could somehow show that this second term that we have here is equal to 0, then I am done with the proof of unbiasedness, right? Because if this is equal to 0, then the expectations of B2 will become equal to beta2 and that's what we want to show. So now let's work with this second term separately and let's try to show that this second term is nothing but 0. So let's work with this second term separately. So I can write expectation of summation ki ui and note that i is going from 1 to n but I'm not going to write it explicitly again and again. I hope that's understood. So we can write that this is equal to expectation of k1 u1 plus k2 u2 and this can go on till kn un, right? And once again using the properties of expectations, we can write that this is equal to expectation of k1 u1 plus expectation of k2 u2 and this can go on till plus expectation of k n u n. Now note that when we defined k i, we discussed that k i is a non-stochastic variable. That is, its value is not going to vary in repeated sampling. So whatever value of k1 you will have in sample number 1, you will have the same value of k1 in sample number 2, sample number 3 and so on. So basically k1 becomes fixed in repeated sampling and we can say the same thing for k2, k3 and so on. So if we have expectation of k1 multiplied by u1, that means we can write that this is equal to k1 multiplied by expectation of u1. Once again, this is using one of the properties of the expectations that we have. If you want to know which property, then I can write it here. So basically expectations have a property that expectations of a multiplied by z, where a is a particular constant and z is a random variable, is equal to a multiplied by expectation of z. So we can take the a out and the expectations will only be applied on the random variable. And this is the property of expectations that I am using here. So because ki's are non-stochastic, so I can take them out and I can write that expectation of k1 u1 is nothing but k1 multiplied by expectation of u1. And similarly, I can write that the second term is k2 multiplied by expectation of u2. And similarly, the last term that we have is kn multiplied by expectation of un, right? Now observe that we are able to write things in this manner only because of assumption number two. In assumption number two, we assume that the capital X's are non-stochastic, which implied that the small X's will also be non-stochastic and which in turn implied that the ki's are non-stochastic, right? So it is all because of assumption number two. And now I can use the assumption number 3 to simplify this further. So if you recall the assumption number 3 was that the mean of disturbance term is equal to 0. And one of the mathematical ways to write the assumption number 3 was expectation of ui equal to 0. 
So this particular assumption implies that expectation of u1 is 0, expectation of u2 is 0 and so on. So that means this equation becomes k1 multiplied by 0 plus k2 multiplied by 0 and this can go on till kn multiplied by 0. And this happens because of this particular assumption. So now on the right hand side we have nothing but 0. And this is exactly what we wanted to show. So now we have shown that the expectation of summation ki ui is equal to 0. That means this second term that we have here is 0. And because the second term is 0, this implies that expectation of b2 is equal to beta 2. So this shows that b2 is an unbiased estimator. Now before I end this lecture, I want you to note one thing here. If you recall, these are the 8 assumptions that we discussed. Now see, it is very important to understand what all assumptions are you using to prove a particular result because this is how you are going to form the interlinkages. So let us now see what all assumptions have we used to prove that B2 is an unbiased estimator. Note that the major assumptions that we have are the first 6 assumptions. So the first 6 assumptions are the major assumptions. We are going to assume that the assumption number 7 and the assumption number 8 are in the background and they are satisfied. So let's now talk out of the first 6 assumptions what all assumptions have we used to complete this proof of unbiasedness. As I told you earlier as well, for this entire proof of Gauss Markov theorem, we do not require assumption number 6. So I can cut this assumption, right? Now let's see if we have used assumption number 1 in this proof. Well, we have used assumption number 1 in this proof because initially when we were substituting for yi, we worked with the population model that was linear in the parameters. So basically we were working with the assumption number 1. So we have used this particular assumption. Now let's move to assumption number 2. Have we used assumption number 2 in this proof? Well, yes. It is only due to this second assumption that we were able to define ki as a non-stochastic variable. So yes, we have used this assumption. Let's move to assumption number 3. Well, we have used this assumption in the last step. So yes. Have we used assumption number 4 and assumption number 5 anywhere, which are the assumptions of homoscedasticity and no autocorrelation? Well, the answer is no. So to prove unbiasedness, we do not use assumption number 4 and assumption number 5. And see, this is something important that you should keep in mind because as we proceed further, we are going to break assumption number 4 and assumption number 5. So we are going to do the cases where we will not have homoscedasticity, but we will have heteroscedasticity. Now, because we have not used this assumption number 4 in proving that B2 is an unbiased estimator, so even if we break this assumption, the unbiasedness property of B2 will not be affected. Okay? And similarly, we can say for assumption number 5. So even if we break the assumption of no autocorrelation, the unbiasedness property of B2 is not going to be affected because when we are proving the unbiasedness result, we have not used this particular assumption. Right? So this is the last thing that I wanted to discuss in this lecture, that the assumption of homoscedasticity and the assumption of no autocorrelation are not relevant to prove that B2 is an unbiased estimator. So even if we break these assumptions later on, it will not affect this property of B2. Okay? So this is all for this lecture. In my next lecture, I will show that B2 is an efficient estimator.